Hello everyone, I'm Esther Vida and welcome to Politics is Sexy. I'm joined with Rich Rubino, columnist and political author, and Tom Farmer, former executive producer for CNN and formerly with Face the Facts USA. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening, evening Esther. Hey, Rich. Hello. All right, so we're going to talk about security in Sochi and the... Putin and Obama relationship taking a little bit of a turn in all of this, but let's begin with the RNC meeting in Washington, D.C. The theme for this year is Building to Victory. Uh, I want to start out by talking about former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee's speech on Thursday, uh, where he told the luncheon that Democrats just want women to think they cannot control their libido or reproductive system without the help of the government. He went on to urge Republicans to wage a war for women instead of against women, as many are saying that the Republicans are doing. Tom, let me start out with you. What do you make of this comment? Uh, it, it's one of the most astonishing logical disconnects in recent political history. The, the exact quote from Mike Huckabee actually is, um, it, 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 this is not a war on women uh, that the RNC is pursuing. It's a war for women, he says. And if the Democrats want to insult the women of America by making them believe they're helpless without Uncle Sugar coming in and providing for them a prescription for each, each month for birth control, because they cannot control their libido or their reproductive system without the help of the government, well, then so be it. This from the party that wants to control uh, your uh, reproductive rights completely. Uh, it, it, just, it just doesn't hold up. And the Republican narrative has been a, a series of, of astonishing, insensitive remarks about uh, uh, women's rights uh, and uh, in the context of, of touchy issues like, like rape. Uh, uh, and, and this is just going to go on that shelf, I'm afraid. The, the Republicans are desperate to improve their performance with, with uh, women voters, and, and it doesn't seem to me this helps at all. In fact, it's the reverse. Um, Rich, you know, yesterday or this week was the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, and uh, some of the events of the RNC were postponed so people uh, could go and uh, demonstrate against this. So what does this say about the narrative of the Republican Party going forward? Yeah, this is very surprising. The Republican Party has always been kind of on the defense. If you ever listen, for example, when they ask a Republican, a mainstream Republican that's running for office, um, their views on abortion, oftentimes they will say, they will say, you know, I am pro-life, but we don't think we're at that point yet to reach, overturn Roe v. Wade. Or they'll say I'm pro-life, but what I'm really focused on, I've heard John Barrazzo from Wyoming, for example, uh, kind of established Republicans say, but what I'm really focusing on is, jo is jobs, is jobs in the economy. They always try to kind of bring it back to that issue. This is something, this is interesting in terms of what Huckabee said, and also uh, former Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum said the other day that, you know, what we really need to do is go on, the, is not be on the defensive on this issue as much as being on the offensive. And then he said, Mike Huckabee, say, Mike Huckabee bring take that issue on head on today, and Rice Priebus, you know, saying that we want, we want the Republican, uh, members of the Republican National Committee to go over and attend some of these um, and, att and attend the, uh, the ceremony of the ceremony commemorating the 41st anniversary of, uh, of Roe v. Wade. It's really been a it's really somewhat of the um, of the uh, of a ship a little kind of below the surface here. I think Republicans are trying to take this head on. But I will say one thing about Mike Huckabee, I think if he's looking for a 2016 presidential run, he might very well be thinking of Rick Santorum because Rick Santorum last time what became the candidate of the social conservatives, I think in 2016, and it appears that Mike Huckabee no longer has his radio show. He did not run in 2012. And I know that he's always had some problems specifically as just Rick Santorum for that matter with groups like the Club for Growth for his economic um, – for his economic views and for raising taxes as governor of Arkansas, he's really trying to stake himself out, I think, as the anti-abortion, socially conservative candidate. And it's going to be interesting to see if him and Rick Santorum both run where the voters are going to go. Because they're both, I think, going to try to get as socially conservative and be, in as, 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 and be as big in the exponent of social conservatism, which we haven't really seen in recent elections. Let me stay on the... Uh, Tom, you're nodding your head. 
Well, you haven't really seen uh, social conservatism front and center in recent elections because it doesn't play the way it's presented by, by uh, true blue social conservatives. With specific reference to the abortion issue, the really amazing thing is that uh, qualms about uh, broad abortion rights are creeping into the, the American mainstream. Right. You look at the Gallup trends for the last 10 years and, and the number of people who describe themselves as no holds barred, no compromise pro-choice uh, declines a little bit uh, since the since the turn of the century. Uh, I think more and more people understand this is this is a, an agonizing gray issue, and they're not comfortable either with uh, hardcore. Uh, you know, com complete restrictions on abortion, nor are they comfortable with the, the kind of uh, casual attitude that, that the uh, pro-choice uh, diehards uh, display. The truth is someplace in the middle, and the uh, Republicans could cultivate that to their advantage if they weren't so hardcore about this mm. and didn't frighten people away with, with this kind of absolutist rhetoric. And, well, and there are some that are... Go I'm ahead, Greg. There are, some that, there are some that are ideologues who, I mean, and I'm not saying that in a harsh way at all, but they believe that, I mean, there are some in the Republican Party, and there are some, for that matter, in the conservative and the Democratic Party, who believe that each abortion is the taking of a life. So for them, there really is no compromise on the issue. Every time you have an abortion, I saw in the Drudge Report yesterday, they had a picture of a fetus, and it said 55 million deaths since Roe v. Wade. I mean, for the, for the strict... For the strict, steadfast anti-abortion crowd, this is not, this is simply this is a life and death issue. They compare it to slavery. They call it yeah. um, the silent genocide. But what's interesting about Roe v. Wade, I will say this is that Roe v. Wade does not legalize abortion on demand like a lot of people seem to think it is. It's the first trimester that where it says the where it says basically that the states can regulate abortion during the first trimester. In the second trimester, the states can regulate abortion in ways reasonably related to the mental health. In the third trimester, it basically say it basically says is that the states can prescribe abortion except where it's necessary and appropriate medical judgment. So this is not a this is not an absolute yeah. abortion on demand case, which a lot of people have may have I think are saying are, are, have interpreted the decision today as meaning. That's a great point. Uh, let's move on a little bit, but stay on the RNC. Um, and you know they did this sort of so-called autopsy after the 2012. Um, election. What do you think are the biggest areas uh, that they need to work on, Tom? Obviously, the the war on women, so-called war on women and, and female issues is one of them. What other areas do you think they need to focus on? Well, yeah, stuff like this, you know, whenever, whenever a story like this gets into the headlines, it reinforces the narrative that this is a shrinking party composed of angry, reactionary, older white males uh, who don't understand the world around them or the world that uh, we've acquired in the last 10 or 20 years uh, and who have uh, not, not sympathy or inclusion, but sort of an angry uh, re uh, re rejectivist impulse towards uh, people of color, towards uh, immigrants, towards uh, any other constituency. Uh, you know, I think we've talked about this uh, on this program several times, but if they don't change that math, uh, the party is going to uh, Studebaker themselves out of existence. Mm -hmm. I mean, down to the point where nobody buys the product, the party can't sell the product, the factory closes. Uh, you, you have to... Uh, Make a, uh, an argument for uh, for the immigrant population, for the Latino population, for uh, independent uh, woman voters who, who decide elections in that swing zone. Uh, you can't just uh, tell them to get lost or or um, make uh, remarks like like Huckabee has made today and expect to get ahead. And the thing is, it's, it's perfectly doable because the Democratic manifesto is incredibly vulnerable right now. Uh, we, the income inequality issue is, has exacerbated under Obama. The uh, uh, long-term unemployment issue is, is exacerbated. Uh, the, you have a, the whole class of people the Democratic Party is supposed to be fighting for right. falling further and further behind. There is a case to be made, but the Republican white male crowd steadfastly declines to make it. And, and, and what, Tom, I, Go ahead, Rich. I'll just say there is, a, uh, there is an angry bloodline in the conservative movement. Now, there is a very happy face that can be put on conservatism. For example, when Jack Kemp ran for president in 1988, for example, he had a more of a happy um, demeanor. For that matter, Mike Huckabee, even when he ran for president, but there's always – and George W. Bush, when he ran in 2000, talking about being a uniter, not a divider – they always, they have to, in a sense, separate themselves from the conservative intelligentsia, the conservative entertainment complex. By that, I mean the Michael Savages, the Ann Coulters, the conservatives who are more cons the conservatives who 
kind of see the see conservatism and the reason there are a lot of them are conservatives kind of they think that um, kind of they, they kind of think in a sense that the middle class is getting the shaft because all the benefits are going to the poor and they tend to divide themselves. They tend to divide themselves as kind, kind of the victim of the, you know they view themselves in a sense as a, as victims. The consistent conservatism as victim narrative has got to be separated from the Republican Party. The Republican Party has to have a more unified message. It doesn't necessarily have to get more liberal, but it definitely has to get more. Right. It has to be seen as being more accepting, and it does not necessarily have to be um, seen as a tribune of the kind of the angry conservative talk radio show host, the angry conservative talk radio callers. And I think a lot of people see those, and they're turned mm. off and saying, you know, this is the angry party. But in reality, there is a very positive message of conservatism as well, mainly the dissolution of power to the states, how people can benefit from um, how people can benefit from tax cuts specifically. That's the a lot more positive message, not just going against, you know, as some people do, going against the Gimli lobby, for example. That's a, that's and, a phrase I hear often. And so with that, Rich, where does the Tea Party fall into all of this and, and their message? And how do you balance that positive message, conservative message that you talk about with the people that are angry, angry at Obama, angry at Obamacare, um, angry, period? Well, Obamacare, is not, being angry at Obamacare is not a problem for the GOP. Um, politically, it is not a it is not popular legislation at this point. Even the most liberal Republican, Susan Collins of Maine, for example, voted against it. That is something that is there in a sense. Um, Cold War. The during the 1970s and 1980s, the one thing that unified all Republicans, libertarians, uh, social conservatives, neoconservatives, was basically the, the idea that the Soviet Union needed needed to be dissoluted. That is actually is that is the health care the health care bill. Um, whether you're Lindsey Graham, John McCain, or whether you're you know Rand Paul, unifying against that is a, is a pocket is a positive thing, and the polls certainly show that for Republicans. Now the Tea Party, I think there is kind of a positive and a negative message um, for the Tea Party. There's certainly the grassroots, the idea that you need to that you need to cut that you need to cut government spending, you need to take care of the deficit. That's a message which I think will resonate with the GOP. The problem is you you have a few people like Steve King in Iowa, for example, Louis Gomar in Texas, Todd Aiken in Missouri. Some representatives of the Tea Party um, will talk will, will say will say things that are um, very politically explosive. They get all over the mainstream media, and then people have the perception that that is the Tea Party ethos. I think when you see Mike Lee, for example, the senator from Utah, giving the giving the uh, Tea Party response to the to the Democrats uh, to President Obama's State of the Union address. I think you're going to see a lot more mellow, a lot more positive type of agenda. I think that in 2016, as we're looking for a presidential candidate who would represent the Tea Party, what, will, what they do not want is one who will represent kind of the angry strand of the Tea Party. There's, a, there's yeah. as I say, a very positive message in the Tea Party as well. A very positive message, basically, that we should, you know, in terms of uh, foreign policy, by the way, there's a lot of non-interventionists, which can resonate with a lot of Democrats, for example, who are angry about the Obama administration's um, activist interventionist foreign policy, the same thing with the Hillary Clinton. So it's not necessarily, the Tea Party should not be looked upon as this monolith of a bunch of angry conservatives. There is the angry bloodline in the Tea Party, just like the Republican Party, and then there is the more positive um, grassroots movement in the Tea Party. And it's really, I think there's really kind of a uh, chasm there, and we'll see who wins out. Okay. Uh, let's move on to Sochi and uh, the Olympic Games coming up. There's been a number of bombs. Uh, there's so-called black widows that are being sought for, uh, after. Um, there's some concern about some of the participants. Some people have said that it's too dangerous to go there. Um Tom, who are these black widows? Who are these so-called terrorists, and and why disrupt the Olympic Games? Well, uh, let's be clear that the bombs that went off of, of days or weeks ago were in Volgograd, which is hundreds of miles away from Sochi, as the nearest major population center. No bombs have gone off in Sochi itself. The uh, so-called black widows are apparently the widows of uh, murdered Chechen. Uh, pick your phrase, terrorists or freedom fighters, the people who are at odds with, with the Russian government. And they are, are said to be seeking revenge on behalf of their dead spouses and are willing to uh, uh, finish themselves off in the process. Why go after the Olympics? It's like asking uh, 
when they asked Willie Sutton why he robbed banks, because that's where the money is. You know, why, the Olympics are where, where the attention is. It's where the whole planet is looking for two weeks. And if you want to make a big point, uh, that's the place to go. Uh, the thing is that it's not that hard to make a big point, no matter what uh, ring of steel uh, that President Putin erects around the Olympic uh, venues. Uh, you can go to Sochi and blow up the train station or the shopping mall. It wouldn't be that difficult. You can launch missiles from a nearby hillside where nobody can find you. You can create havoc, and I expect somebody will try. Uh, it's, it's um, I, I think... Uh, probably unstoppable. But remember that um, all Olympics are a security nightmare right. to one extent or another, going all the way back to um, Munich 72, which um, uh, devolved in, in, in very unhappy ways. And, you know, most of us remember watching that uh, fall apart on television. Uh, uh, the amazing day that when uh, ABC Sports was transformed into a news organization, and suddenly people like Howard Cosell and Jim McKay were reporting the biggest terrorist story in the world. Uh, that is... Uh, I think the, the odds are, are, are moderately good that something like that will happen here, too, wow. which is why uh, news organizations are flooding the zone. Uh, I, I, you know, any Secret Service uh, agent will tell you that uh, chaos is never 100 percent preventable. Security is never guaranteed. You just try to lengthen the odds. And if people, they will also tell you that if somebody is really, really determined to do some damage, mm. their odds are pretty good. And these people are really, really determined to do some damage. So everybody hold your breath. And I guess I bring up the bombings just because of this whole perception that the area is not safe. It raises a lot of questions about not just Sochi, but the entire country. And uh, Putin has now asked the United States for a little bit of help. How hard was that, you think, for him, uh, Rich Rubino, to ask the United States to come in and help law enforcement there? I don't think it was very um, hard at all for him. I think that I think that Vladimir Putin, um, you know, this is his this is his um, this is his kind of brand. This is well, I, I got a feedback there. <laughs> this is you know, this is his grand vision is he wants to have the Olympics, and the fact that he has to go to Barack Obama and ask for help, I don't think is I don't think is deleterious to him at all, either at home or abroad. I think he's been doing interviews with American journalists. If anything, this um, helps him, I think, with his image in America, mm. because in a sense, the enemy of your, the enemy of my enemy is what is the expression? The enemy of the, the enemy of my enemy is your is your enemy or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Something like that. I'm trying to the enemy of my, the the friend of the enemy whatever. I get it, um, Rich. So, <laughs> the, reason, the point is there. The point is they're unified. Um, and they, despite all the differences that they have going back, you know, for Obama, for example, was very critical of Vladimir Putin, even when he was running for president in 2008, um, when he, Russia invaded Georgia. Um, so he's been very critical of him. But this is something that unifies them. And I think it's interesting, specifically on the issue of terrorism. I think that um, Americans tend to look at terrorism, specifically suicide bombers, in a religious context. Um, basically, they're, basically, I think the standard view is that they're Muslims and they want to go to, and they basically what they want to um, go to heaven and they want to convert everyone else to Islam. That's not necessarily the case. Oftentimes, it is because they view um, what the, is what they view as Western imperialism. For example. Um, the 9/11 attacks, for example, there was it was opposition to the U.S. policy in the Middle East that we were in, intervening in the Middle East, whether it was sanctions on Iraq or um, supporting some of the um, supporting some of the secular nationalist organizations. The same thing with Russia. It's the idea that Russia's Russian imperialism over mm -hmm. Chechnya, over the Dagad region, that kind of right. thing. I think it's interesting to look at some of the suicide bombers specifically. This always tends to be. Um, an issue of whether it's interest or troops garrisoned in their country, it always tends to trump anything to do specifically with religious that is, with religious issues. I think we need to kind of clarify that, and we saw that with us. We're seeing yeah. that with Russia. We see that all over the world. Going back to the you know the Tamil Tigers in terms of which really um, exploited the whole suicide bomber um, issue. Now it's interesting you say that this is actually going to uh, unite Obama and Putin. Yep. Uh, because you also have the Snowden situation. There are allegations that uh, Russia helped Snowden um, move there. There's also the Syria question, and this week we saw the Syria discussions blow up um, with some disagreements between what the Obama administration, Senator or former Senator Kerry, now Secretary of State, uh, Kerry wants or sees as a vision for Syria and what the Russians Take. So give us a little bit of context, Tom, about how, where the Sochi Games and Snowden and Syria all fall into place. 
well, uh, boy, a lot of rings in this circuit. So I'm not sure they do all, you know, intersect perfectly. But let me just say uh, on the Sochi security thing, the risk is more with Obama than with Putin. Uh, Putin mm -hmm. would like to spread the risk around. He would like a market basket of people r responsible, joining him in responsibility for security. He, uh, I think, senses he's over-personalized the uh, uh, security guarantee uh, uh, to uh, a degree that's not great for him. So, of course, he'd like some... Uh, some American help, uh, mm. you know, sharing the risk. Uh, if, if something goes sideways, it won't be entirely his fault. Good then, point. So Obama has to uh, uh, appear to to be open to helping because we got people at risk there too, uh, but not in a way that makes him uh, co-owner of the bag if there is a bag left to be held. Uh, on the Snowden thing, you know, um, interesting development today. The Federal Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board came out and right. said, you know, NSA domestic surveillance is illegal. It's got to be stopped. And, uh, you know, it's like watching a football game where one side gets a touchdown, then the other side gets a touchdown. We see <laughs> who gets more good decisions left at the end of the game. But but uh, the people who think the NSA is trouble uh, seem to be winning the game right now. Uh, not for nothing. A few hours after that, did the Attorney General tell us MSNBC that, yeah, we can make a deal with Snowden. You know, clemency is not uh, going to happen. He's we not can talk be, uh, about it. Yeah, yeah. He's not going to get a ticker tape parade when he comes back, but he's not going to spend the rest of his life in Guantanamo. There's going to be a discussion, which, of course, is where this thing has to end up. You know, yeah. what are you going to do? Uh, he's going to die in Russia. He's going to live there another 60 or 70 years. It's ridiculous. So, of course, this is going to get talked through, and the Russians have an interest in stabilizing the uh, hmm. the balance of power once again and, and, and putting us away. It's not a comfortable situation for them either to have Edward Snowden wandering around Moscow because of the lingering suspicion that uh, uh, he's um, given up uh, the keys to the kingdom to the uh, Russian intelligence services. Oh, it's probably not true. They've exfiltrated everything they possibly can from his hmm. devices, but chances are you know, they haven't won the war by... Uh, pummeling Snowden personally. Uh, and on, on the Syria thing, you know, it's another case where the U.S. wishes it hadn't said half the things it did, hadn't drawn all the lines in the sand we drew, and <laughs> uh, offered ultimatums and then backed away. You know, uh, yeah, I would think Obama would like the whole last year to do over on, on that score. Uh, but once again, we got to um, find common ground with the Russians and strike a balance of power there and find a way to stabilize the situation, which is not going very well if you follow the news out of the peace talks. Uh, so all these things are, I guess, a little bit interconnected. But uh, They all have uh, Obama uh, and Putin at the Square Center, and it really is more of a, a, a public policy or foreign relations question on how they address all of those things. And so that's what I'm well, looking Sochi at. Well, will be over in, in two weeks or three weeks for good or ill. The Snowden thing will probably be over in a year. Syria could go on forever unless uh, cooler heads prevail here. So uh, I, I suspect the Syrian difficulty will uh, live beyond the Obama administration and, and be a problem for the next guy or gal in the office. Yeah, and I think both Obama and Putin realize that they are they realize their strategic interests in terms of sometimes they're not necessarily going to conflate with each other, and sometimes they are. I think they realize that they're they're independent um, entities, and sometimes they will sometimes they will disagree, and sometimes they will agree. I mean, just like any other world leader, you don't necessarily have permanent um, allies; you just have permanent interests, as Henry Kissinger said. Okay, so. We've talked about a little bit about Obama and his um, foreign policy and, and not, you know, drawing a line and saying things and not doing things. And um, his flag, his numbers have been down in most polls. Um, you mentioned Obamacare being a uniting thing for the Republicans against him. So let's talk about the 2014 and um, the election coming up in Convince Me. Uh, will moderate Democrats be able to get re-elected given Obama's numbers. Great question, Rich Rubino. Uh, so you've got 45 seconds to convince me. Will they or will they not? They have this a very austere challenge. Right now I will have to say that they will not, specifically in the United States Congress, because no matter how conservative you are, the fact of the matter is, specifically in the United States Senate, the Republican opponents are going to try to are they going to try to link you to President Obama, who's unpopular in places like Arkansas with Mark Pryor or Mary Landrew in Louisiana, Mark Bayich in Alaska, Kay Hagan in North Carolina. They'll try to link you and they will say, okay, they will say that you're going to basically 
you, that you may ne- you may not necessarily be the most liberal um, representative, but you're going to be voting for the leadership. And that's a very hard argument to make why they're not going to be voting for the leadership. It's Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi who are not popular either. The fact of the matter is there will be plenty of commercials that show President Obama with shaking hands with some with a Democrat, even if it's somehow superimposed. Um, you start when what you this it's very important to realize that Jim Matheson in Utah and Mike McClinchar in North Carolina both decided not to run this time. They represented the two most Democratic districts, the mo- two most Republican districts represented by a Democrat, because they know that it is going to be a very it, that it is going to it is going to kill their chances at future elections. For example, Jim Matheson might want to run for governor. Okay, Utah, wrap it so, up. By, by the way, if you're running for governor. It's a lot. It's a lot easier if you're running for governor, by the way, to distance yourself from Obama because you don't have necessarily um, the whole entire the idea of you know. He okay, so Rich, with Obama, even though half those things. Are, so yeah. Rich, twenty seconds over. But so will they or will they not? In one word, one answer: yes or no. No. Okay, no. Tom. Tom Farmer, go ahead. I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I, I've already said the Republicans will take back the Senate. The House is another story because you have a, a greater uh, likelihood of Republican uh, nominees for House seats who are uh, uh, outlier uh, Tea Party types who are more angrier than reasonable. And uh, we have plenty of data to show that uh, running those kinds of guys just propels uh, Democrats back into office. So I do not think that uh, moderate Democrats will have trouble taking back uh, or holding on to House seats because I don't think there'll be such discipline around uh, uh, the kinds of people who get nominated on the Republican side. But I do think that uh, you'll see uh, three or four moderate uh, U.S. Senate uh, uh, Democrats fall to uh, Republicans who are more middle of the road and more attractive. Even with the narratives that you're hearing at the RNC this week? Uh, it, it's easy for uh, mainstream uh, Republican uh, uh, senators to disavow that kind of thing. People like uh, uh, John Cornyn and Mitch McConnell, they're, they're going to survive their primaries and go on and win despite all the excitement. And, you know, McConnell can't even get... Uh, uh, the guy, the guy who was challenging McConnell in, in the primary, Gavin. he can't get consultants to uh, go to work for him. He can't get a staff hired because everyone's terrified of uh, ending up on the wrong side of Mitch McConnell in a losing effort. Uh, so, you know, that kind of thing kind of self-corrects in the Senate. The House is a lot woolier landscape. Okay, Tom. You know what Mitch, I just say quickly, you know what Mitch McConnell did that was really genius is he got Ron Paul, he got the director of Ron Paul's 2008-2012 presidential campaigns to run his campaign for re-election. So, and he has the and he has the unwavering support of Rand Paul. So that really kind of mm. I think inoculates him from a lot of the criticism on the Tea Party. The fact that he has both the support of both of both men. But Jesse Benton basically runs his campaign, and Jesse Benton was what you know was was one of the founders of the Tea Party in the sense he was one of the he was one of the uh, Main key was the guy who ran Ron Paul's both for Ron Paul's Ron Paul's campaign. So, okay. so it's really played strategically very well here. Okay, Tom Farmer, you got you convinced me on that one. Uh, I agree with you about the uh, Senate losing, though. Um, we've only got a couple minutes, so I want to mention a few things. If you're watching us on live stream, thank you. We'll be here every Thursday night. If you're watching us on YouTube, check out our Facebook page and make some comments and share your thoughts and now it's time for what am I missing what are we not talking about that we should be Tom Farmer you convinced me so you go first uh, well I think what we're missing is that the, 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 your um, steady uh, and faithful politics is sexy panel uh, lacks uh, Ferraris Rolexes and trips to Bur- Burgdorf Goodman and we would be happy <laughs> to uh, pursue the agenda of any donor who wants to set us up that way. Uh, in all seriousness, this poor, uh, poor Republican governor in Virginia, Bob McDonald, who was uh, on the threshold of the vice presidency a little while a ago. A rising now, star. Uh, As yeah, was well, John now, Edwards, by the way. Well, and, and look what happened, you know. Um, in, um, at kitchen tables in state houses uh, or in governor's mansions uh, all around the country tonight, there are spouses uh, being disappointed, being told, you know, there is no Ferrari for you. There is no trip to Bergdorf Goodman. You can wear a, a Timex, not a Rolex, you know, uh, because of stuff like this. It's it's incredible what proximity to power will do to people. Yeah. And uh, uh, I wouldn't underestimate the effect of, of that story uh, on the 2014 elections as people – 
people always say governors are exempt from the kind of scrutiny that uh, occurs to legislators. Well, look what look what governors go up against in mm. these situations. Very interesting. Okay, Rich Rubino. And mail those Rolexes to Esther Varner, <laughs> Box One, live stream, uh, and we'll decide which ones we like. That's right. Yeah, we haven't heard anything from Rob. We haven't heard anything from Rob Lagojevich lately either, have we? So I don't know no, how he's no, doing. No, will you? You know, he's he's in the big house, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. I think, he'll, I think he'll be out in about fifteen years, and we'll have to hear from them. But <laughs> I and can't wait. Will still be <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rich. Um, yeah, and he'll still be trying to revive his career. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, there, was a, there was a movement in the state of Arkansas for a recrudescence of the Democratic Party. In 2010, um, the state, for the first time since 1874, Republicans took over the state legislature. Right now, they own, they own all four congressional seats and they only all House seats, and the only Senate seat that the Democrats have is Mark Pryor, and he's hanging on by a threat. But this year, even though it's supposed, to, even though President Obama has has extremely low approval ratings, there are some very top tier candidates running, specifically for governor Mike Ross, who actually was Bill Clinton's driver in his eighty two president gubernatorial campaign. Whoa, congressman from two, since from two thousand to two thousand twelve. Who's now Did you say driver? For governor. Uh, he was his driver in two, nineteen eighty two when when Bill Clinton had his comeback campaign um, against Jim Guy Tucker, then against Frank White. He was the guy who drove him around the state. He's been a congressman since 2000. He, he actually he was smart enough to resign so he wouldn't lose re-election. Now he's going to run for governor. Pat Hayes is running, the former mayor of North Little Rock, is running in the first congressional district, and James Lee Witt is running in the fourth congressional district. And he was he, he was the one who headed FEMA both under the Clinton administration. Three very top tier candidates. Mm-hmm. So the question is, why are they running at a time when at a, in a state first of all where President Obama lost by 20 points last year? The answer could be Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton has stratospheric job approval, personal yep. approval range over 70% in the in the state. And Bill Clinton is going to make Arkansas this time around. He's been there about every six weeks now. This is kind of his frontline priority is to get people elected in Arkansas, even in an off year. We'll see if he can do it. And part wow. of that, I think, is so that they can have some sort of a Democratic infrastructure so that in 2016 they can bring de- they can bring an Arkansas back to the Democratic column for Hillary Clinton. That's where I think a lot of this maneuvering goes. Very, very interesting. It's running some of these seats. Watch Mike Ross running for governor of Arkansas specifically. Ooh, that's very interesting. Rich, thank you so much. Tom Farmer, thank you for watching, everyone. Politics is sexy. Again, check us out on Facebook and YouTube. Great discussion, you guys. Have a good night. Good afternoon to you, Tom, over over in the West. <laughs> good night, everyone. Go Seahawks, everybody. Yeah, good night. Good night.